Good evening, everyone from Mumbai, and good day to all joining us from different parts of the world. We have people from the US, Canada, Mexico, Latin America, Europe, Africa, North Africa, and of course, India. And maybe many other countries. So why don't you take a moment to introduce yourself and put down who you are, which organization you belong to, and which country you are logging in from. I think there are people still joining in. So whilst they get into the room, please, could you list yourself in the chat section? So I'm thrilled to welcome you today to this panel on responsible leadership in industry at the UNIDO Conference on Women in Industry and Innovation. My name is Elsa Marie De Silva. I'm the founder and CEO of the Red Dot Foundation and the co-founder of the Gender Alliance. Now, what's the Gender Alliance, you may say? It is a cross-network initiative bringing together feminists from the BMW Herbert Kwan Foundation's Responsible Leaders Network, the Global Diplomacy Lab, which is uh, by the German Federal Foreign Office, and the Bosch Alumni Network. So welcome once again to this in interesting panel. It's all women, so Vanel, an opposite of a manal, but I think it's very, very exciting to have all women. And you will notice that we have a variety of different industries represented over here and different regions of the world as well. So without further ado, I would like to introduce my panelists, Ambassador Louise Blay. She's the ambassador and deputy permanent representative at the permanent mission of Canada to the United Nations. We have Sylvia Mukasa, founder and CEO of Global X Investments Limited and Global X Innovation Labs from Kenya. We have Rania Reda, founder of Ogmania.com. She's from Egypt and Germany. Pratama Kirloskar, president of innovations at the Kirloskar Brothers Limited from India. And Nina Lopez Lugo, who's the founder and pro bono of Venture Mexico. So welcome, ladies. How are you doing today? I'm going to start with Louise. How are you, Louise? How's it going? Hello, Elsa. I'm great. I'm great. I'm very happy to be participating in today's panel. Uh, I, uh, I was tweeting earlier today that I, I, I feel already that I'm, I'm learning more than I'm going to share. Uh, through uh, because of, of everyone that's on the panel with me. So I'm looking forward to speaking to, to all of you today. Um, I'm in um, just outside New York City, uh, where it's a beautiful day, and uh, these are strange times, but it's great to see everyone um, moving forward, and, uh, and I'm really happy to be here. Thank you very much for including me. Wonderful. Pratima, how are you doing? It's evening, late evening in India. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you for inviting me, and I'm looking forward to some very new learnings and perspectives that I take home after this discussion. Thank you. Rania, where are you joining us from? Well, I'm joining you tonight from Egypt. Uh, I live between um, Berlin and San Francisco, but I was in a visit uh, to my family back in Egypt where the you know, lockdown of all airports were closed. So uh, I was privileged during this crisis to have some good time with the family. Sylvia, and where are you joining us from? And how's it going over there? Hello, I'm joining you from Nairobi, Kenya. Um, it's evening, um, it's just starting to get dark. <laughs> yeah, but everything's fine. Um, it's nice to have all of you on board and I'm also looking forward to learning from everyone and just having a good exchange on this um, during this panel discussion. Great. And Nina, how are you? Fine, thank you. I'm here in Mexico City. It's an amazing day, a shiny, shiny morning. It is, it is early here, it's in the morning. And I'm, I'm honestly super happy of being in this space with amazing women like you. So I, I'm pretty sure that we're going to enjoy a lot this moment. So thank you. Super. So we are going to keep the gallery view so that you can see all my amazing panelists. And don't forget to put your questions in the chat section. I'm going to kick off with a round of questions for each one of them. I'm going to start with Louise. Louise, today's discussion is on the theme of responsible leadership. 
and you work with the government. So I was wondering, how does one innovate within the government on this theme of responsible leadership? Thank you very much, Elsa. So often we think of government as, as, a, as a place of, of, uh, of uh, strict limitations. But in fact, I'm pleased to say that um, government can be a wonderful place of innovation. And it is, it is one that we are continuing to explore because with innovation, you have the aspect of risk taking. You cannot innovate without taking some risks. And um, I'm lucky to work in a, in a, uh, for a government that is really expanding its tolerance of risk. Uh, of course, we have to be extremely careful with the public purse. The fact that we're managing dollars that come from, from um, taxes that are, that are collected from, from our citizens. So it, it does um, uh, force us to be extremely careful. But at the same time, there are things that can be done. And for me, responsible leadership, whether in government or outside of government, is about thinking beyond what it is that you're doing in that moment, is seeing the, the, the reverberating impact of, of what we're doing and, and how is it benefiting uh, the greater good. And I'm lucky enough within the government to have the responsibility here at the UN uh, for Canada, for the uh, SDGs for Agenda 2030. So I live with the SDGs every day and I'm able to kind of see um, the kinds of uh, the, the important role that government has with achieving the SDGs. But I'll just close in answering your question with, with one piece that we still have to work on. And this is why this panel is so interesting. For a while at the beginning, uh, after the SDGs were adopted, a lot, of, uh, a lot of countries felt that it was the government's uh, role to achieve the SDGs. Um, and, and, and at the federal level, because it was the federal level of all the countries that came together and signed uh, and committed to the SDGs in 2015. But we soon realized that you need to work with all levels of government, whether it's provincial, municipal, and all the others. And then even more, uh, civil society is an, has to be an integral part of achieving the SDGs. And then, and those, those first uh, actors have actually come to the table quite naturally. The one that has been more difficult to integrate in the work of achieving the SDGs from a government perspective has been the private sector. And now we're seeing this happen and we're seeing the private sector in some cases be uh, uh, in, more innovative and more advanced on achieving the SDGs. But there are areas where capitalism is actually leaving a lot of people behind. And this is where the government can come back and play a role to help guide uh, the work of the private sector to enable it, incentivize it through a variety of means that government has to work very closely with the private sector, which is something that Canada has done uh, very much at the UN. So, uh, so this is what uh, uh, responsible leadership in the government uh, is to me, is thinking beyond the immediacy of the work you're doing and making sure you integrate uh, all, uh, all of society towards achieving uh, the SDGs. Thank you. Thank you for kick-starting us on the SDGs. The Sustainable Development Goals are really a great framework for all of us to uh, you know, guide our work. And uh, since you spoke about the private sector, let's go to uh, Prathama Kirloskar. She comes from one of the oldest uh, family businesses, the Kirloskar Brothers India. Uh, Kirloskar Brothers Limited in India, they do a lot of work um, in uh, different fields, different sectors, and I'm going to ask her, how does one go beyond corporate social responsibility and apply responsible leadership in bringing progress and development to stakeholders, especially in rural India, and especially uh, in, you know, for women? Because one of the aims of the SDG is leave no one behind. So thank you. Um, you know, we are a 130-year-old uh, engineering conglomerate. And as it happens that we were set up in rural India, and we've always chosen uh, to set our factories in rural India. So when it, when it comes to employment and skilling these people, we could only skill those people who are around us. Um, not necessarily were they even educated. So it was, a, it was open to all kinds of people. So that was one thing that we did, was employ them. Today, we have people who've been working with us over three generations, and they have upgraded themselves from 
uh, from mere workers to becoming doctors and engineers and very well known social workers today so i think leadership is about development of skills livelihood health education and of course women's rights so when we set up in these rural areas we also had to set up schools for people so we have an 87 year old school we have a maternity uh, home where we work with women for prenatal postnatal we do a lot of training for all these villages around and we have a primary healthcare center as well uh, where all our workers and nearby villagers come because at that time there were there no primary healthcare centers so i think that gave it a holistic approach then we also uh, used to publish magazines there are three kinds of magazines one is called three which means women um, basically for the housewife so they teach her some skills they uh, update her with what is happening around them and also some forward thinking uh, approach for women uh, manohar which was for young when men and women and there too they taught them some innovative things that they could do and a good approach to life and kirloskar which is the third magazine which taught them about our products and our services our good practices and how you can scale up your work and of course interesting articles from all over the world and mind you this was when there was no telephony when it was weak and there was no internet which is non existent so also we worked with nearby villages for uh, a program called clean and beautiful schools because you believe that if sanitation is good then health of uh, the nearby area is good and i think even today with covid the main thing is sanitation if we are able to take care of that i think there's a huge area and a leap you can leap from beyond this uh, we also built some temples and social where people could gather socially and interact with each other because when you are so deep down in a village uh, there is not much that you can really do so you do need to interact with people and we'd have a social club where we'd promote artists so we had artists and artisans and musicians would come and perform and many well known mu musicians in india today have come from that belt uh, then we said let's do something for women and in the 60s we started something called mahila udyog that is a factory for women for destitute women so that was one experiment that worked well then in 2011 we said let's work with young girls so the age group of 20 to 35 we trained these dropouts who were eight standard and tw and 10 standard dropouts skilled them today they can make a pump they've actually made it to the linka book of records where they're able to assemble a pump in 17 seconds and these are small pumps but what this did to them was it made them bread earners today their parents don't force them to get married uh they've got a huge amount of respect and their spouses actually relocate for them so i think that is the social change uh that we are wanting so now we now go to the educated women and we've now working with engineered uh, women who are in engineering and we've started a replica factory which employs a lot of engi engineers and this is in our township again in a rural setting so i think that a development is Uh, is a all round we need to take care of everybody in the ecosystem so that's how we view it thanks prathama for giving us that overview and for our global audience india has a unique act which mandates that all listed companies have to put aside 2% of their average three year profits towards corporate social responsibility and the activities have been listed down uh there is one uh, section in those uh, in the list which is on women empowerment and a lot of uh, the csr money is being spent on gender equality uh and other projects so i'd urge you to look that up because it's a great way for corporates to think about how they can support uh, government as well as civil society in fast tracking some of these sdgs I'd like to move on to Rania now. Um you are a serial entrepreneur. I think you're on your third business. So can you share some of the challenges women founders face and what can be done to encourage more women to start businesses because on one hand corporates like uh, Kirloskar Brothers have been investing in rural women and other you know women to help them start their own businesses give them life skills give them uh, you know a little bit of that nudge and that platform to thrive and here you are you know uh, your third business is based out of silicon valley so tell us more and you're also on the arab uh, board of uh, women isn't it so yeah. So I wear so many hats. Uh, I'm I'm a member of uh, you know a responsible leader with the BMW Foundation Network, 
and also on the steering committee of uh, Digital Arabia Network, which is an, also a network of innovators in the MENA region, um, bridging the gap and connecting them with the you know, companies that would uh, looking for digital transformation in the Western world. Um, I'm also, as you said, like a serial entrepreneur, born and raised in Egypt, moved to San Francisco and from there to Germany. So I can tell a lot about the different maybe challenges that you can face here and there. I would say that challenges um, have always been there, right? And uh, to be honest, uh, the open and hyper-connected world that we live today, uh, actually it, it, uh, it shows more challenges and faces, like, you know, Im imply more challenges on both genders, right? And both genders are facing the challenges just to prove themselves in this open world that they deserve the chance to, uh, they get, right? However, I always say that the winner will always be the hard worker, the fast learner, and the self-confident. And those are the three key, uh, let's say, key factors for success in our open connected world. So I can see that the problem, to be honest, is partially that the women in business themselves being so ambitious and career oriented is something that requires dedication. It requires, uh, you know, um, putting yourself and your career uh, as a priority. Um, while usually in our, maybe also more on our Arab world, so the women are to be the ones who take care of the kids, the family, the husband, uh, maybe the elderly parents. So you, you end up with so many responsibilities that you have to take care of and you have to be excellent. Like we women tend to be perfectionists. So we want to do everything like the best way that we can do while you cannot be perfect in everything, right? So it has to be, um, there is a trade-off between things that you have to measure and, and setting your priorities. This is one thing. The other challenge I would say is that um, taking the risk of believing in yourself that you can really break you know, the, the, the ceiling, the glass ceiling and uh, move forward, take your idea to places where you can implement it, you see the market, you see the investment. That's what we have to do because that's what happened, um, at least to me, and a lot of, of women around the, in the MENA region. So wh where you can find the support or the opportunity or the investment, you have to go seek for it elsewhere, right? So, but however, like, uh, let me tell you, uh, the irony here is that when I moved to Silicon Valley, I thought so that's going to be the heaven for any entrepreneur. Like, I, I'm going to build a startup. Next day, I'm going to get, you know, the first investment invested writing the check and I go build the biggest unicorn ever that I think of. Actually, it turns out to be um, in Silicon Valley, only 2% of the whole investment that was in for 2018, 2019, only went to female founders. So you can imagine the percentage, the low percentage of women getting the support of investment to grow their business. This is one of the biggest challenges that we have to focus on. Because without the investment, without the, the support, you cannot grow the business. It will reach a certain, you know, growth. And then that's the level that you can reach. That's one thing. The second thing is, I would say the main challenge is um, mentorship. Like we tend to have, like, we need to understand a lot of, uh, 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 of business ethics that we have to uh, take care of when you're dealing with international business, for example. That's one thing. Secondly, is that um, mentoring a woman is different than mentoring a man in business because we have different challenges. We have different emotional, um, you know, different emotional intelligence, but also different emotional uh, reactions that we can, you know, have to manage and control. So no one would be better than a woman mentoring a woman to give her the advice and this. So I would say those are maybe on top of my mind, the basic challenges or the most important challenges that I would see. Thank you. And that uh, also highlights the point that networks are so important for women, especially one like the BMW Responsible Leader Network and gender alliance within it, where you can, uh, you know, we are creating a safe space to not only discuss issues, but also fast track some of the work that we're all passionate about. And we'll come to that in a moment. Uh, Sylvia, you're, you're an entrepreneur, but you're also promoting a lot of innovation through your labs. So can you share with us, especially um, what encouraged you at an early age to, you know, start this and how can, how does it really help the ecosystem in the global south? Okay, thank you uh, very much, um, Elsa. So I 
I worked in private sector before I got into self-employment. My last role being at Ericsson, where I was responsible for um, strategic planning covering sub-Saharan Africa, uh, about 54 countries, uh, sorry, 40, 44 countries um, then. Um, so what happened is I felt like I needed to do something, um, you know, that would make me drive my own agenda. I was very passionate about technology from an early age. And um, as much as I was um, employed before, I always felt like I was being suffocated by um, other people making decisions uh, in terms of whether uh, what I thought needed doing would be done or not. So I felt um, going into self-employment would help me um, do what I wanted to do, um, especially around technology. And uh, initially I, I started off um, mainly just um, consulting um, in the IT and telecom space, um, given my experience at Ericsson. Um, and then I realized there was a disconnect between um, what industry expected and what was actually happening on the ground in terms of education, um, especially. So you find schools have curriculum, um, and this curriculum is set without necessarily in involving um, industry. Um, so um, you'll find, for example, university graduates going through school um, but then when they get into the job market, they're not really ready for it. Um, and I felt upskilling was going to be very important um, to ensure that um, people are getting the right skills um, as they go out into the market. So I considered, uh, I um, sort of merged my industry experience and my entrepreneurship um, angle to um, try and get people um, ready, um, especially when it comes to skilling them um, for industry and also helping organizations that are wanted to digitally transform, um, especially using emerging technologies. So what we do um, at Global X is mainly around emerging tech. But then um, as years went on, I realized I needed to include the aspect of inclusivity in what I was doing. Um, so then I moved away from just focusing on businesses and then started looking at um, the wider society. So um, as we look at emerging tech, how do we ensure children, for example, are prepared um, for you know, um, the future of work um, and that kind of thing. And then also linking that to what industry is doing around emerging tech. So um, for the kids, um, there's been a lot of uh, activity going on, um, different people doing um, STEM education among children, but a lot of them uh, don't have um, the you know, the kind of background someone like me um, has, um, having gone through working um, in industry and then now um, going out into the market. So I merged all that and said, um, emerging tech is new, but um, it's not too early to get kids, for example, into emerging tech. So um, we included in our, um, uh, you know, a product portfolio, STEM education for children focusing on emerging tech. And the reason is um, children's uh, brain development begins uh, between um, age zero to five. 90% of the brain development happens around that period. So it's very important to start shaping the brain at that early stage. And so um, generally preparing children and giving them the right skills at that age so that as they grow, they're able to um, use um, you know, their creativity because um, it's shaped and triggered at that early age. So um, it's important to get uh, children, for example, um, doing stuff around innovation and uh, entrepreneurship because again, um, what, what's been predicted is that um, according to the World Economic Forum is that nearly 133 million new jobs may be created by 2022 while 75 million jobs will be displaced by, um, by AI, uh, automation, and robotics. So looking at that, we have to prepare uh, children and young people so that you know, they are future ready, have the right skills at uh, the right age. Um, and then again, um, when children are exposed to um, this kind of activities, then um, they're able to shape their cognitive skills. Um, and they, they, they do these, um, through sustained attention. For example, when they're connecting the uh, you know, blocks, uh, what, when they are coding, for example, uh, using Scratch and the likes of CodeSpark, they, they build on their sustained um, attention. 
And then it also builds on their visual processing because they're looking at things um, as they build and also develops their working memory because they learn as they go. Um, and also just generally boosting their uh, problem solving skills. And then when you expose children again and also young, young people um, to uh, entrepreneurship skills, you're basically um, helping them build on their networking skills, uh, their leadership skills, their financial uh, literacy. Um, they also learn from failure in how to move forward. So these are very important skills. And they also just uh, get to determine what kind of um, careers they will take in future and also begin to understand technology. Why is this important for the global South? Um, we can't emphasize the importance of um, innovation and entrepreneurship, um, especially in economic growth. Um, SMEs, for example, um, are really major um, contributor to economic growth uh, across the world. So there's nothing as good as, you know, having innovators and entrepreneur, entrepreneurs, um, you know, from in, in uh, different economies to contribute to that. Um, also, um, innovation and entrepreneurship are very important um, in developing, uh, for example, the regulatory environments. Um, so I'll give an example of M-Pesa, which is, you know, um, um, a mobile money solution that's um, been working pretty well in Kenya. And uh, when M-Pesa first started, there were actually no regulations around it. Um, but then um, as the product came into the market and started being used, then regulation was formed around it. So that, that, that helps economy, economies um, develop on their regulatory framework. Um, also, entrepreneurs are problem solvers and innovators. So they are solving a lot of problems uh, that we have. Uh, look at what's happening um, during this COVID-19 period. Um, a lot of young people are actually coming up with um, innovations. And yeah, that's very important uh, for economics. Yes, and COVID-19 is showing us how um, you know, the future of work is really changing at a very rapid pace, but also without digital access, you really can't uh, survive. So it's very important that everybody learns these skills, but more importantly, that governments get the digital access to the people, especially in the rural areas or the low-income communities. Um, Meena, coming to you, you worked in corporate and now you are the bridge between corporates and, uh, social, uh, and civil society where you encourage volunteering, which is a great way for corporates, organizations and individuals to give back. Can you share the benefits of encouraging corporate volunteering and, you know, like people usually think that when they go and they volunteer, it's part of charity or giving back or, you know, it's good. But in, in reality, they also benefit in so many ways. Can you explain some of the work and what you've learned from it? Yes, of course. And actually, it is more than give it back, Elsa, what you are mentioning. Right now, the thing is that we have a network. It's a network all around the world. It's a, a pro bono, global pro bono network with more than 50 organizations all around the world. We are in Africa, in Asia Pacific, North America, Europe, Latin America. But what are we doing? But we are helping corporates to organize strategic pro bono. And the strategic pro bono is a different kind of volunteering. You can go to a place in which you can, I don't know, help to plant trees, and that is good, and you have to do that. But at the end, what we find out is that people, they want to volunteer their skills. And they want to do something for others, but with what they already know how to do. So it has been amazing in the sense that we are helping actually, in Pro Bono Venture, we are helping corporates to invest in a different way in social organizations because they are not investing money, but they are investing resources that at the end they have the value of money. So to give an example, there is a coalition that is called CECP uh, that has more than 150 corporates, the biggest in the world. And Last year, they make this study in which they give the value of the pro bono, the hour pro bono from corporates, and it is around $195 for, per hour. So that means that when we make a, a pro bono mission with around three to five people to help a social organization, that is an investment from around $10,000 to even $75,000 for free. That is something that the organization is not paying, but that is the value of that talent. So that kind of intervention. And their interventions about strategic issues that the organization is 
probably really good doing what they are doing. But when we talk about strategy, when we talk about long term, they need other kind of people to come by and help. So that is, that is what it is done. But the most important thing is to do this kind of interventions. You have to prepare the people from the corporates and help them. They have the skills, they have the knowledge, but now they have to become a, a, a consultant. So how am I going to ask the question? How am I going to be served? So that is the way in which we change these kind of things. And then we come to the part of a women and gender. We have participants, male, female. We make groups that they are, of course, mixed. But uh, yeah, the kind of participation that we have for women, to be, to be honest, as Sylvia mentioned, uh, as Rania mentioned, we are perfectionists, right? So we want to be there and very, uh, like, participating a lot. So it is helping in two ways. Corporates are doing investment of non-financial resources in social actors. And they, on the other hand, they are developing skills also inside of the corporate. Why is this important? We are talking a lot about giving opportunities to women. But sometimes inside of the own corporate, they are some, sometimes they are limited. And it is important when they can go out, and we have seen that, and they can show what kind of talent they have, their skills, they manage groups. When we have do these groups, it doesn't matter if we have a director and we have someone that has a different level. They work as a team, and they are they equal, equal in, that, in that team. So it is an amazing moment in which they can show what kind of talent they have, how they are doing things. And when we move people out of the corporate, to go to a social organization in which they have very limited resources. Sometimes they are these entrepreneurs that they are in, in these hubs. And suddenly they say like, they are not offices, they are not walls. And I can see a dog walking here, what kind of place is this? Well, that is out of the world. So, and they have to start thinking of something different. It's a problematic that they have all the different kinds of skills and knowledge and talent to, to be able like to find that solution, but they have to innovate and they have to see things in a very different way because it's a different actor and, and we have to be in these bridges and we are building bridges between these corporates and between the social organizations. But I think it, is, it has been, at least in our experience, an amazing opportunity to see women shine. Honestly, it, it, is, it is impressive. The way they, they, they put themselves there and they started doing this kind of things. So I think uh, corporates, they have they're a very good opportunity to see what they are doing and to give them the opportunities inside of the corporates after they have this kind of interventions. Men, they are doing it amazing too, but uh, there is like also this kind of thing that we, we see with women, the kind of commitment is a little bit different. <laughs> totally, and with that, that kind of commitment, we definitely need more of them in leadership positions. Uh, I was reading this Forbes article, which was talking about you know, the countries that have done well during COVID-19, uh, most of them have had female leaders, yet only 7% of heads of states are women. So, <laughs> Louise, when we talk about a feminist foreign policy, which is now the buzzword these days, why is it important? And why is a gender lens in policy making uh, important and how does it benefit women and society at large? Because people seem to feel threatened when you use the word feminist, feminism, and they think that it's only going to benefit women on one hand and the men are going to be left out. Can you share what uh, Canada, which is one of the foremost countries with Sweden that is really pushing this agenda and many more countries are following as well. So please share your experiences. Thank you, Elsa. Well, I think you, you've casted it very well and, and um, Canada put in place its uh, feminist foreign policy and its feminist uh, development, uh, international development policy uh, several years ago. But it, it was interesting that so that went out and that was done and it, it flowed from the prime minister's personal commitment uh, as, a, as a feminist himself. Um, everyone will recall probably the, the famous uh, way he answered the question when someone said, uh, why was it so important for you to have a, a parody in your cabinet um, when he formed his first cabinet? And he said, it's because it's 2016, you know, come on. Uh, like it was just, why are you even asking me this question? And so the government um, ever since has been committed. Uh, and it started with this, a little bit of this international policy, but then all of a sudden, we ended up tabling a budget, a feminist budget. So, you know, every year, countries have to table their budgets. Um, and uh, 
so a few years ago, we tabled a feminist budget. So what does that mean? It basically means that every single, uh, every single initiative, every single aspect of the budget has been put through a gender lens. Will it help women? Will it hinder women? And uh, will it be neutral? Uh, and of course, anything that would be detrimental to women at large would have to be rethought and, and probably recast. So, um, so we, we're, we're talking the talk, uh, we're walking the talk, I mean, in Canada now, but it doesn't mean that it's easy. It isn't easy for the reasons that you've, you've outlined. So now, you know, we are pushing, and it's interesting because we're using our development dollars, for example, um, to, uh, to, to forward this agenda. So uh, what does it mean inside the UN system? It basically means that it's not just UN Women and UNFPA that we're speaking to. We're speaking to UNICEF, and we were speaking to UND, uh, uh, UNDP, and we're basically saying, if you're going to continue to receive our funding, we want to make sure that you apply a gender lens to all the activities you do so that we make sure that we don't, not only do we promote women's rights and women's empowerment, but that we also, uh, we do not inadvertently hurt it. So, um, and so, you know, of course it takes many forms and too, too complex here to discuss, but uh, when, when, when you look at each program, and then you apply the gender lens and you, you basically use your, 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 your dollars to encourage other organizations to do the same. Um, the, the change that it can bring, up, bring about is, is limitless. And we have certainly have seen it. Um, and uh, we've been really proud as Canada to have been a part of that, uh, that advancement. Um, just in closing, I could say that to your point about uh, the exclusion piece, uh, this is something that Canada cares very deeply about because as you know, we are a very multicultural country that is very inclusive. We believe that diversity is our strength and that it's something to be leveraged. So this is how we talk about gender equality uh, internationally. We say this benefits everyone. Uh, because women are catalysts of change. And we've heard this just today in this, in this panel, and it's something that I'm sure everyone that's listening already knows. Uh, so when you invest in women, you actually benefit everyone, boys and men and everything. Now, that doesn't mean that we don't have to do a lot of education, but I have to say that um, just a personal uh, quick e experience, when I visited um, cities on the border of uh, Turkey and Syria, a year and a half ago, uh, when I was on the board of UNICEF, um, I we went into this this uh, and of course the all these border towns in Turkey have had a, an enormous influx of refugees coming from Syria, and that has been challenging uh, on all sorts of levels in terms of social integration and cohesion. Uh, some 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 cities went from being uh, ter uh, ter uh, uh, Turks became minorities almost overnight. So this has put a lot of pressure and, and there's the gender piece in all of this because a lot of these um, refugees come from rural uh, parts of Syria and not all, but with a lot more traditional views about women's roles uh, compared to maybe the, the local, um, uh, the areas where they're moving into. And they were having, uh, UNICEF is funding uh, an organization that was hosting these, these teenagers having sessions. So you had boys and girls on each side of the room. Um, talking, answering questions about whose role is it to cook uh, and, and who, you know, who should be going to university. Uh, and you know, the boys would start the session with, well, women should be cooking. And, and, and then they would get friendly challenge uh, from, 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 uh, from the woman's side of the room where they would say, well, I want to become a doctor. Why is it that I shouldn't? And, and and by the time of this, just one hour of talking, and they would giggle and laugh, and of course they knew that we were there watching. So, but you could see how these boys' minds could get opened just by exposure to something new, and they might have been brought up in, in a very traditional household, and that's not the you know that's okay. And you have to respect that. You have to respect where they're coming from and, and that they hold, they have a lot of respect for their mother, who's probably more traditional in roles. But when you can validate that and say, that's okay. But 
it's also okay to do something else. Why shouldn't you be cooking once in a while? And what's the problem with that? And, and it's amazing, as uh, Sylvia was mentioning, the sooner you can get to them and talk to them about these gender roles uh, uh, and change their mindset, the better. And uh, so these are programs that directly or indirectly Canada uh, supports. And uh, it may be tied to a refugee issue uh, and social cohesion issue, but we've applied a gender lens. And this is what organizations like UNICEF are now doing um, and uh, in so many uh, exciting ways. Thank you. Thank you for your work. Uh, it's really amazing. And with a little bit of uh, push, a little bit of attention, like you said, you know, gender lens on budgeting of how the money is being spent, who is it being spent on, et cetera, can make such a huge difference. Pratima, so you're in charge of innovations in society within your company, and you work mainly, you know, uh, in rural areas, in the agrotech space, et cetera. So can you share some of the successes and especially where, you know, when we think of a farmer, most often it's a woman, but we don't imagine that, you know, it's like that uh, riddle about the doctor and, you know, the doctor is looking after the uh, accident victim and the, that's the son. But you always think as the father is the doctor, never the mother. So it's these gender norms and gender roles in your head. And so also with the farmer, most women are farm. I mean, most farmers are women, but when we are asked to draw the picture of a farmer, it's usually a man, or we think of that person as a man. So can you share some of these success stories, especially how they are benefiting women in, uh, in your space? Okay, so you know, uh, because again, we are set up in a rural area, and I said that there are, we were doing some skilling and training for women. Um, so around the township, what we did is there were some uh, retired workers that we had. So we asked them to take some of our machines and become entrepreneurs. So when they took some of our machines and became entrepreneurs, uh, they needed some working capital, uh, which a bank would not give them. So we spoke to banks and said, you know, we're going to be buying all the products that we are manufacturing. So could you please give them the working capital? And that is one reason why banking moved into, uh, into the rural areas in Maharashtra. So we had Bank of India, who actually, we have a, now a relationship with them for 70 years because that's what they did. Bank of Maharashtra came there, Bank of India came there. We also started a post office in our township. And uh, you'd be surprised that today, the post office has hundreds of crores of rupees, which these people have actually made over these 80 or 100 years, and they have put it in that post office. So that developed a lot of vendors and it developed uh, livelihood around because the minute they start earning, they educate their children. And their children now, again, not necessarily become, uh, become vendors or, or, or manufacturers. They go on to uh, becoming computer specialists and doctors and they've moved on. So there was another innovative program, uh, a rural innovative program uh, for education, where we said, uh, you know, that there are 100 days uh, that children in rural areas are free. Most of the farmers are so poor that they can't really uh, hire people. So their family is actually their, uh, their workers, right? So they say, we can't uh, spare our children for anything. We would like to uh, send them to school only when they uh, have no work. That is between uh, the time they sow and they reap. That is about 100 days. So they coined this word called 100 day school, where these children would go to uh, a gurukul, which is where you go to your teacher, you live with your teacher for those 100 days, and then you educate yourself. Uh, the system they used was quite like the Japanese command system where uh, you go from grade one to grade 10, but you do it at your own pace. That is, you may be in the same class, but there'll be different students at different levels and you permit that. So it, they may not finish it in 10 years. They may take 20 years, but they finish it all the same. So result is you do get educated. You get the minimum education, if nothing else. Uh, within India, you know, we specialize in fluid handling. That also means that we necessarily need to know the terrain. Uh, so depending upon the contours, we decide irrigation systems to optimize water consumption and prevent wastage. So to help, with the help of the government, we set up these irrigation systems all around our township. Today, that area has become lush green and all these farmers have started growing sugarcane. Now sugarcane is a cash crop and that gives them a lot more uh, uh, funds than an average crop would do. So you find very 
rich farmers in this area. Similarly, when we uh, use some of our innovation methods uh, in Ahmedabad, uh, you know, we dropped the cost of the pumping stations. Result is we needed few pumping stations, but today Ahmedabad gets water twice a day instead of getting water, you know, once in two days. Uh, similarly, outside India, you know, in Laos and Cambodia, uh, these countries, uh, well, we worked with the government. So these countries were actually uh, importers of rice. Today, they're exporters of rice. And the minute they've got this money in, it has helped livelihood in that area. So I think that uh, business is a small way of starting your livelihood. But the fact is, it has far-reaching effects where it comes to uh, higher education. It comes to empowering women to do more things. And we've seen this time and again that when you empower a woman you empower the whole family because she always sees the collective good she doesn't see only the good for herself and i think that is the biggest change that you empower them and the entire society gets uh, gets benefit so i think there's small innovations in the system or in the product and deployment that can help achieve this and create a huge amount of livelihood and that came up even in the forbes article where it says that the reason one of the um you know why these women leaders did well with their countries is because they thought of the larger good and they were able to take quick action so that's coming out even in all these stories over here uh, Rania, since we were talking about feminist foreign policy and even um, you know a gender lens can a feminist lens in developing technology also help to make a better world please share your examples Absolutely. Absolutely. I would say, let me tell you this. So um, I have to say that my father was the biggest believer in my capabilities. And actually, he encouraged me all the way to achieve my goals until, until it comes true. So uh, as a way uh, to pay it forward, I thought, OK, let, let me support the woman uh, uh, in my community, the tech community, uh, who, who weren't lucky, like myself, to have my father as a backbone. So I remember a funny story when I started my first startup 10 years ago in Egypt, in Alexandria. And it was like not so common what I was doing there. It was a very deep tech, you know, technology. And I started with five female engineers. So only girls. And uh, they were used to call us like the pink company, you know. That kind of um, grabbed the attention and I should say provoked the, the, the gray hair uh, men in, in my community and in, in our ecosystem and they it was like what are you doing so you are saying that there's a lot of biases and discrimination but then here you're coming with you know only walking in the room with only female engineers and project managers and so on um, I would say it took us very hard two years um, but the girls were doing amazing job amazing job and actually they proved and they proved my point like give a girl a chance and see the miracles that she can do so two years later i remember those you know uh he was a, a, a general in the in the egyptian navy so he was sending me his granddaughter as an intern in the company because he wanted her to be you know grow up among role models around her like successful engineers who are pursuing their career doing their job so, so it was hard in the beginning, but then you can see the conversion. And I would say it takes one man to get to the point that he is our ally. You know, it's, it's not us versus them. It's, it's us all together, working together, building this community together. When it comes to tech, you can see usually also the stereotype that girls are good in uh, the visual things. So they're doing uh, user interface, they're doing uh, digital stuff, they're doing... Uh, you know, designs and, and things, but the, the real code, the, the deep uh, algorithms and so complicated things, uh, that's for boys. And actually, it's not the case. It's, it's all about what, where your passion is. It's all about what you can do. Everyone was like, you know, created for a mission in life that this is what I'm good at and this is what I can do perfectly. So give me the chance, put the right person in the right position and give him the chance to prove him. So when we, um, when we actually like, you know, uh, it was a very successful uh, phase in my life with the startup because we got a break even very quickly and we had an exit uh, like a few years after that. And they were saying that the girls did it, that the girls made it. And it was a success story that I'm super proud of everywhere there. So when it comes to technology, again, I would say that um, now 
um, things are a bit changing, uh, moving to a better situation. Also because post COVID, uh, they decided that, okay, we can hire people who can work remotely from home. So for girls and women having, again, responsibilities for their families or kids, it was very convenient for them to work from home, very convenient to, you know, manage between, juggle between the two uh, um, jobs that they have. It's, it's a day job for, for both of them. So I think it's, um, it's changing in a positive way. Elsa? Elsa Maria, are you here? I think he was, he's frozen. She's frozen. Um, yeah. yeah, tech issues. <laughs> so, um, Mina, I think you wanted to say something, right? Yeah, is that I was well, listening to all of you and, and all the different kind of experiences and coming from, and from the government and also social enterprises and entrepreneurs and everything. I, it, this is actually an invitation to all the people that they are joining us because uh, we are also a group of uh, responsible leaders. And in, in Mexico, we were very worried and talking about the things that we, we are worried about what is happening in our country, right? So we started having these conversations. And of course, leaded by a woman that is a responsible leader from, from, from Mexico, the Tarrios. She said, well, why don't we start giving to our country? And we organized something that, that we named the, the, the Week of Democracy. So this week of democracy has now supporters, male and female, but it is a week in which every day is going to, we are going to have a different table. So it is a table about, in this case, a childhood and democracy. But we are going to talk also about the G16 with people that they know about it. And now we have people that are participating also from the government. We have another one that is about citizenship and very different formats in, that we are creating because we want to have this kind of dialogue. We don't want to, to fight with the government. We want to give something, you know? We want like, to have this conversation with society and say, okay, we, we want democracy. We want to do things. We, have, we want opportunity for, for, for girls. We want opportunity for, for women. We have opportunities for everyone. Why don't we start having these conversations? Like, like in this moment that we are doing this and we can inspire someone. I am very happy because, for example, in the case of uh, this childhood uh, table, the, the moderator, the job of Elsa is going to be done by a girl that she's eight years old, she's indigenous, and she is a scientist. So she just had a, like, a very big, big award. Actually, it was three, three, three children, and uh, it was like a world award, and it was amazing. So she's the one that is going to, to, to moderate this kind of dialogue. And we are going to have people from very different places we're going to talk also about the B Corps in this case, and we're going to have some examples and people there, but having this conversation on how can we as citizens add something? And we want to have deliveries as, as well. So, okay, we are having this conversation, you government probably you need us to participate more. Well, we want to tell you what can happen. So what, what's what you need to do? Give ideas, how we can participate the most. How we want, we are women, we want opportunities. Well, here we have a dialogue. You can have these conversations, these are the outcomes. Why don't we do something together? But do it not from only one group, do it like open to everyone. And we are doing this, it's going to be for, for the whole country. The, the invitation is for it. And we of course want to register this kind of experience or so to invite other people to replicate it. You know, and to have all these, these, these tools and all what, what we're going to have. This is going to happen in August, but this is just an idea, you know, we are capable to develop different kinds of things. And again, this is led by, by a woman, and we have the support of amazing men that they are participating and they are giving their time. And this is a pro bono thing that we are doing as citizens, that we are really, really interested in our country and we want to, to have better opportunities for everybody. So that, that is, I guess I, I think she's having some problems with her, her sign now. But well, that, that is what I wanted to, to share and to invite uh, people to, to join others that they are interested in doing things that uh, probably they're going to take us to other places. And, and please invite, invite men. We have been having that conversation about how important it is to, to invite men to, to work with us. There you yes, are. Yes, you know, we need everybody uh, because we are not going to solve the problems on our own and women can be very inclusive and i know louise has a whole uh, 
um, you know, theory about it, which we'll come to in a minute. But uh, Sylvia, I want to give you a chance to add on to what Rania said about, um, you know, tech and innovation. But uh, maybe you can speak a little bit about applying the principles of responsible leadership to it, uh, simply because COVID-19 has shown us that the same old ways of doing business are not going to work in the future or in the current scenario. We have to think out of the box and we have to have bold new vision. So yeah, would love to hear from you. Right, so um, basically we'd be thinking around social, economic and um, environmental challenges. Um, in terms of how we lead and uh, how we make uh, decisions. So um, I believe having sustainability and equality at the heart of um, what we do is very important. And then generally looking at the mission and purpose um, and also technology and innovation and uh, the inclusion of stakeholders should come a second nature as, as leaders in tech. Um, I'll give an example of what's been happening um, or what was discovered through uh, research that was done by Accenture, which showed that 65% um, of CEOs actually agree that we need to decouple um, economic um, activity from exploitation of um, natural resources. So we need to look at that, especially when we are addressing uh, things like uh, climate change. And then the same report also showed that 87% of CEOs um, actually believe that there is a global economic fragility. And um, this just means that we need to refocus on equitable growth. Um, and when we look at the fourth industrial revolution, um, new technologies have to be managed for both um, their gain and also for their peril. And around this, I'll give examples of how AI, for example, um, is, has been an area of uh, a lot of deliberations in terms of um, how it's being used. So AI um, has actually uh, been used to solve a lot of um, issues in, 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 um, in the world. But then again, unfortunately, AI applications tend to reinforce um, social biases, um, especially around gender and um, also around race. Uh, quite recently, we did see that IBM actually got rid of the facial recognition um, um, product because of how it's being used and abused, um, especially when it comes to uh, racial matters. Um, so ethics really playing, playing out around that. Um, another thing is that uh, there's the risk of leaving a lot of people behind in the workplace. Um, what we are seeing is between 2017 and 2019, um, there's, a lot of, there's been a lot of investment on emerging tech um, but only 18% of organizations are planning to significantly, significantly increase um, the spend on reskilling of their staff in the next um, three years. So what that means is that there's gonna be a chunk of people that are being left behind, yet we're thinking of um, having um, you know, inclusive uh, tech. Um, another thing that's been playing out um, around ethics is um, people getting worried about cyber or digital colonization, um, which is a big issue. And uh, this comes at the cost of um, personal data and also um, privacy. Um, so that you find that there are organizations, especially those that are helping um, build uh, the local digital ecosystems in Africa, for example, that are, tend to um, want to monopolize how information is used. Um, and so this kind of cyber uh, colonization is something that um, organizations should be uh, working against, especially um, as we innovate and use technology. Um, cyber security and personal data protection is also another area that's been lying behind. So people are not in control of their data and yet they should be. Um, giving an example of Africa, for example, we find that only five um, African countries have actually ratified what the African Union has put in place. Um, and then again, as we speak about um, inclusion, um, we find that um, uh, not so many women, um, I think women only hold 22% of um, professions um, as, as, as AI professionals. 
So those kind of things need to be addressed. Um, and as we talk about, um, you know, um, avoiding things like uh, digital colonization, it means that uh, there has to be human capital development. So um, there's need to equip, um, uh, to equip professionals in tech um, so that um, there's digital uh, sovereignty, um, you know, in avoiding other, you know, countries that are advanced or have the money uh, controlling um, others. Um, another thing I would like to say is that just in summary, um, you know, as um, uh, responsible leaders in tech, I'd like to um, give a summary of what I think should be the key rules, uh, just to wrap this up in a simple way. So one of the things that needs to be done is uh, companies need to be transparent and simple and fair with their customer terms. Um, and then they need to design ethics into their product. I gave the example of AI and how it's being abused. Uh, thirdly, uh, they need to invest in building a common understanding of ethical issues, especially when they're working um, around different geographies and cultures. Um, fourth, they need to use of legal and policy frameworks uh, pro proactively. Um, and this is just um, basically, uh, for example, when you use lawyers, um, they, should, they should be used um, in the product development phase and not just when there's a crisis. So that when products are being built in tech, they are ethical. Um, finally, we need to shape the ecosystem to keep the interests of all stakeholders. So whether we're looking at gender, um, um, you know, in other players, everybody has to be uh, at the bottom line of tech innovations. Thank you, Sylvia. Those are very thoughtful recommendations. I'm having a lot of tech issues today because it's raining very heavily in Mumbai. So I hope it stays on for another 15 minutes. Louise, I'm going to take some audience questions and I'm going to club some of them. So uh, there's one question that says, what is your advice for women to demonstrate a leadership in a male dominated occupation? For example, manufacturing sector, but it can be easily applied to government as well. And there's also another question, which, um, you know, is how do you lead effectively during the times of continual transformation? First, Louise, and then Pratima, you can answer on this. Uh, thank you very, very much, Elsa. So those are great questions, and they're very complex, and we don't have a lot of time. So I'll be kind of very brief and succinct, understanding that, of course, it's much more complicated than that. To your first question about how can women succeed in male-dominated fields, which is basically every field, unless you're a nurse uh, or you know those stereotypical roles that women have been assigned, um, it's it's for me it has been um, it has been uh, it has centered around um, uh, conforming uh, at first when I was younger. It's been about validating male leadership. Um, and it is, and it sounds terrible, I get it, but you know, this was, you know, 30 years ago or whenever it was, long time ago. Um, and uh, I challenged it when I needed to, but most of the time I got along. And my first job was uh, with Interpol, uh, with the uh, uh, Canadian uh, Royal Mounted Police. So back then the police environment, macho environment, you can just imagine what it was like for a young woman to come in as an as an analyst, uh, they at first they like who is she? Who does she think she is? She doesn't know anything about policing, um, and but so I knew that you just you have to recognize it and go okay. This is what I'm walking into. These they're used to being able to have their macho talks, be goof around the office do kinds of things that men do when they're only alone with men. And now all of a sudden they have this, this sort of uh, woman in their mix. And so you have to understand that they're not necessarily comfortable and that unfortunately sometimes it's our job to make them comfortable. And so I became one of the guys. I did. Um, and I adopted a, a joking way about them. I, 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 and, and then once I fit in, then I was able to bring them along and, and, and I ended up, you know, I think it ended up, uh, there was a little bumps on the road. I won't describe them, but they're fairly outrageous. But it ended up being a, 
a wonderful relationship. And by the time that I left, uh, I think I had earned their respect and, and, um, and, and I was better off. And then I took that experience and built it up. I, as my career uh, went along, the challenges were not quite that steep. But, you know, sometimes when it's clear that it's a male-dominated world, you see it straight on. You see what you're facing. When it's more subtle, I think is harder to address because it is the, the kind of limitations that are difficult to see. And in government, that's exactly what's happening. Why is it? that it's a very, my government and my country is very progressive, but why is it that women do not raise to the ranks of, uh, of leaders uh, uh, inside, inside the government to the same rate as men? So those are, are harder and that's a bigger conversation. I'd be happy to have it another day. And your second question was also, uh, if you don't mind reminding me because I really wanted to answer it and I'll be briefer. How do you lead effectively during the times of continual uh, transformation? Okay, so yes, that one I am happy to answer too because it's very close to my heart. The first thing first is women are best equipped to deal in this environment. I'll tell you why. It is because if we embrace our, our, our nature, if we, our own authenticity of caring and, and, and nurturing, it actually helps people go through difficult experiences. I've just, through this COVID-19 uh, experience where all of us had to change the way we work, uh, the, the, the approach that women leaders can bring, the thoughtfulness, if they're true to themselves, because I think I'm afraid that there's a lot of women leaders that um, I think are, are um, um, like I wouldn't want to generalize. I think it takes, it takes everyone to make a world and, and there are more authoritative and more um, there are women leaders and they have a place and, and, and that's okay. But I think for the probably the majority of us, we have a, we, we care about people first because we tend to understand that without happy, successful, fulfilled people, you really don't get the outcome that you want. You might get it in the short term, but if you're focused only on results and you're not focused on the well being of your teams and your colleagues and the people around you, and that counts for the people above you as well because they have to be taken care of too. If you don't put people first, I think in the long run, you people suffer around you, and um, and and then I, you know the, the, their their ability to adapt to change goes down. Everything goes down. So if you're willing to show your own vulnerability and say, "I get it; it's tough for me too," uh, or you're able to share your own experience of hardship or difficulty, whether it's with mental health or otherwise your own personal experience, and you're able to create a safe space for people. I find that it's been my experience that they go through change, uh, learning from it and being better for it as opposed to suffering from, from the changes. Thank you, Louise. Pratima, maybe you can answer Carolina's question, uh, which is, you know, women during COVID-19 are working three jobs, work from home, work for home and work at home because they have to look after the children and in many places like in India, as in many parts of the world, women uh, pick up more than their fair share of the domestic work, which is unpaid as well. So she she's based out of the West Coast of uh, the US and she's seeing that mothers are not doing well and many are choosing to leave the workforce. Can you tell us how you've implemented or envisioned to implement programs or policies that are most supportive of this reality? And if you want to add to whatever Louise said. Um, yeah, you know, I think that, uh, that women because of COVID may do well because now they can work from home and they can give time for their families without actually leaving their families. Uh, this, uh, the problem that most women had was they would take a half day job and they'd never be paid as much as the men. The result is I think with being home, they can learn some more. They can take courses that are offline. Yes, the hardship is this, that they are running, doing three jobs simultaneously. And honestly, they, they may need to, uh, to choose one of those because it's very hard to change a man at this point of time but you don't want to sacrifice your children or your home. So I think uh, it, you may need to sacrifice one or the other temporarily, but you know, COVID is there to stay is my belief for another two years. And you know, the whole world is going to change the way they look at women, because I think women have this way of being very adaptable. They, they can work in teams, they can work, you know, they adjust so much all through their lives that it comes very naturally to them. 
they don't have they don't make a big fuss about it whereas men are going to find it very difficult because they are very pampered and they're a pampered lot you know so honestly i think we are going to win this race uh, what is important is that they underestimate you and sometimes there is something to be said about that underestimation you know when you underestimate an opponent you always lose and uh, though this is not a question of winning or losing it's a it's a question of equating and i think women will gain ground because of this because they are going to be able to do so many jobs simultaneously and in a collective way for a collective good which is going to be very difficult for men to deal with because they're so self centered they see themselves first there is a woman sees her family first she sees her children she's able to see the helplessness the pain she can feel pain for others you know so i think she's a very sensitive being let's not underestimate what we can do it's the sky is only the limit so honestly temporarily it's a setback yes in the long term you're you're there to run this race faster and longer than anyone else can be in it because you're already in it you don't even know you're in the race so i don't know if that answers uh, answers your question but i do believe that uh, during this time women have to start taking courses to equip themselves with new skills you know you spoke of machine learning and ai and i think these are skills now with the kind of mit edx courses all over the place open universities and online training again sky's the limit you can keep on working in the kumaon system at your pace the way you like it enjoy it and move on I mean, there's no reason to crib. I think. Thank you for that, Rania. Uh, there's a question with the coronavirus in our midst. How can SMEs prosper, and what more can be done aside from those already in place in countries, especially in Asia and Africa? Well, I'm I'm really uh, surprised that people would think that COVID-19 was hard on SMEs. I see it's a very good opportunity. Maybe because I'm an entrepreneur, and I. I have to say that entrepreneur mindset, like you will see opportunity in every crisis. That's the point. So, from what I'm seeing now, we as you know, startup slash SMEs, you have the agility to work and the you know to maneuver between different um, business models and business. You have to update your product to what's going on. So uh, your team need to be also. agile enough in their way of thinking and handling the job and thinking of solutions unless you are really hard hit by the you know you're working in hospitality or transportation or the industries that really was was very badly hit by coronavirus uh, any other industry there is a lot of opportunities and i see like there is okay so covid came everything went virtual so now you have to develop new solutions the world is changing and this is a new world a new normal that we're we're seeing here and as pratima said that it will take us like maybe 2 years until things settle back to a new normal which we don't know how exactly it will look like so starting from now i would say that what happened with the covid-19 is like the whole world came to a reset right so recession is everywhere uh, economy is like you know uh, impacted everywhere like you know the the most rich countries as if like you know the poor ones so now the game is starting over and now the only one who can do it right this time is the you know very fast learning um, being agile adapt to what's changing don't stick to your products don't stick to your it's not it's not your baby come on let go of the ideas that doesn't work in the post covid 19 world right be dynamically changing adapting your theories ideas your team talk to your team talk to people around you looking at new opportunities there's a lot of things that need to be you know developed and new solutions a new life a new products i wouldn't say it's um it's as 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 sad as it sounds but we see a lot of opportunities and i'm i'm mentoring a lot of um, entrepreneurs and i'm amazed with the brilliant ideas they're coming up with you know to cope with the covid-19 so uh, if you're stuck in a point then you're only looking on one wrong direction so you have to stop reflect think again and look around you and see all the opportunities that you can tap into thank you meena we are going to take this question from vimbai so many people give advice on making the right networks for women to advance in business or in their careers as well my question is what can you do if you have not had the privilege to make those networks due to one's background how as women can we support each other to help other women break those barriers 
I, I love that question because that is very, very related to my story because I started with corporates. And the moment that, the, that I make the change to start in this world, the impact sector, I knew nothing, but not how it worked. I, know, I knew that I wanted to be there, but I knew no one. I have no idea how it was. I have no connections. I don't come from a wealthy family that they open to me or some things like that. So it was like at the beginning, I have no idea what is this. So it, I imagine that I started Googling, what is an NGO? <laughs> like, what are the characteristics and things like that? Because I, I knew that I wanted to do something like that, but what is that? So in that time, I, I, I applied for a scholarship uh, to study a master in, in social responsibility. And to be honest, the thing that I check out from there was the people that I met because then I started meeting people. And then I started finding out events and I started going there and I started asking questions. I think 12 years ago, it was a little bit more complicated because we didn't have this social media, you know? It was not that easy to have contact like in groups of Facebook and things like that. But we, we need to start building these networks. And what I think it is, it is happening now is that women are very open. There is something that is important. For me, I think the most difficult thing was to start asking for help. At the beginning, it was like going to places, meeting people. I have never been like shy to be the first one to ask the question when they ask like, who has a question or whatever, I participate and whatever, I was doing that. But then ask for help, like, can you mentor me? Or what can I do here? I, I don't want to do that. And in my case, it was because I was coming from some kind of status that I thought that, that I have. And in that moment, I was like in zero, blah. I uh, have no idea how, how this works. I, I have skills that I know that I could apply. So I think that for women, when you don't have that kind of network, because it happened to me, it is you have to go out and you have to start approaching people and you have to start asking questions and you have to start showing and you are going to find out places that sometimes they look and people that they some, sometimes they look so shiny because you see the articles you see that and when you meet them they are not the kind of people that you are going to be capable like to, to link to click and and that is very important that we we go out and we start uh, having conversations and talking with women and asking for help Honestly, I, I mentor some, 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 well, now I mentor even guys, uh, but it has been interesting because they come by and they are humble and they say like, okay, can we talk about this? And you start having these conversations. For me, it was very difficult the first time that I approached someone, but I see that that person was really like, I really, really want this person to be my mentor. And I was like, my goodness, the first time I didn't say anything and the second time I, 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 I make it. And what I received was, uh, of course, yes, we can start doing this. I've never, ever, ever received a no. And if it's a no, it is someone that probably is not the, the correct person for you, of course. But what is very important is that then I started finding out that I wanted to do this kind of thing with women. At the beginning, it was with men. But then I found out that it, this is with women. We have a very, very a horrible barrier that I don't know why some people say that the biggest enemy of a woman is a woman. And believe me, that is not true. That is not true. And we are there also to support each other. And I have been in a lot of groups and circles in which we do that. If you don't have a network, start building your own network. But there are ways in which you can do it. Now, what I feel that I have, and, and the thing that is most valuable for me, is actually that kind of different networks that I have built. Because now you, you are with the people, and you learn from them, and you share with them, and you help, and those are some kind of opportunities in which there's not the network you build it. Go outside, don't be shy, be there, speak with people, and you're going to find out what, which are the kind of people that you want to be there. And actually, when we have a conversation previous to this, uh, I was asking to our panelists that, well, can we offer a mentoring? Uh, can I offer you as a mentor? And they all say yes. So if you see someone here that you are interested, like to be your mentor, to help you with this, we are very open to do that. And, and, and don't be shy, do that. Go and ask for help, it, it is worth it. Thank you, Mina. And I'm gonna take one last question. Sylvia, you have exactly one minute. Uh, how do we have more of these conversations with teens to change their mindsets about gender roles in Africa, which is primarily a patriarchal society? 
Okay, thank you. So I'm African. I understand our, our society pretty well. Um, so one of the things that I personally have been doing, um, I'm part of other networks that are um, you know, passionate about empowering uh, the girl child. Uh, one of them um, is the Tech Women Alumni, which I am part of, and it's a US uh, State Department program. And we have um, women from across, um, you know, uh, from Central Asia, from Africa, and from the Middle East. And there's been a lot of initiatives that we've been doing, especially to engage high school girls, purely by um, taking the initiative to go to high schools and speak to girls, uh, tapping into the networks and getting different uh, role models uh, to speak to girls in high schools and, of course, working with the schools. Another way is, um, for example, I am a mother of a teenage daughter, and every time I've held events or I, um, you know, that there's something that I feel she would benefit from um, in terms of an event, I actually tag her along because uh, then she gets to meet people. It's easier for her to take them seriously than she would um, hearing it from her mother. But when she hears the same things um, from other women, then she listens. So if you're a parent or if you're an auntie or a sister and hear of a tech event, drag along the teenagers. Most of these events are, you know, will allow them um, but also from our spaces um, as women in STEM, for example, then we have to um, go out there and uh, engage the teenage girls. Thank you, Sylvia. And I'm going to answer the last one. Is the gender alliance only for women? Of course not. It's for everyone. It's the gender. Gender doesn't mean only women. It's everybody. <laughs> and it's an alliance. So we need everybody in this fight to achieve the sustainable development goals and in particular gender equality, which is my favorite goal, number five. And I would like to say that, um, you know, I'd like to thank my panelists, Louise, Pratima, Meena, Rania, and Sylvia. They are all amazing women. Thank you, UNIDO and BMW Foundation, Herbert Kwan, for giving us this platform. It's amazing. Every one of you out there, mentor another woman. I got this advice very early on. Once you reach a level of success, don't forget to reach your hand down, pull the other one up the ladder, make sure it's a woman. Uh, you know, try and make sure that it's more women than men <laughs> because they need an extra lift up. So do that, do, you know, there are a lot of resources available. Uh, take up Meena on her mentoring offer. Sometimes we as women have to put ourselves out there. We have to learn to take a little more risks in life and be bolder. So I know we are doing a lot, but stay well, stay healthy and thrive. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Elsa. Thank you, everyone. Yes. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you to all our speakers. That was incredibly inspiring and it touched on so many of the themes of the conference. It was brilliant. Um, and that concludes today's uh, series of sessions. Uh, we hope to see you back tomorrow where we will talk about uh, empowering women and bridging the gender gap in circular economies and also hear from more role models before closing our session. As always, you can engage in the community boards and um, organize virtual meetups. And yeah, the platform will be open for six months after this conference. So any connections and conversations you have, feel free to take them as far as you can. Um, this is exactly what we're hoping to achieve with this platform is to really generate so many new partnerships, so many new connections. So yeah, um, on that note, see you tomorrow. Bye, thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye, see you.